Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Mr. members. Thank you. You may take your seats. This podium is a bit high or something. Um, I don't know whether we can take it down a bit. Anyway, um, the Honorable Joseph Ntakuri Timana, Speaker of the East African Legislative Assembly. Honorable members, the Secretary, the Secretary General of the East African Community, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first take this opportunity on behalf of the government and people of Kenya to welcome honorable members from Yala to Nairobi. And it is my wish that you will enjoy the liberations in Nairobi and also have time to enjoy Kenya. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, let me apologize uh, because um, I have been away from parliament for now more than 10 years, and uh, I found myself doing the wrong things. Because when it was time to applause, I, find myself, I found myself clapping. <laughs> and I know that is not the tradition in parliament. I had to remind myself. But uh, I am delighted to join this august assembly today to preside over the official opening of the third sitting of the third session of the fifth East African Legislative Assembly and to have the honor of welcoming you back to our parliament chambers in Nairobi after six years. It is immensely gratifying to note that the, for, the work of intensifying the integration of East African community has proceeded at an encouraging pace so that while much remains to be done for us to accomplish our aspiration, the progress we have made has taken us closer to it incrementally. It is no overstatement to acknowledge the contribution of this assembly towards making this progress possible. At the beginning of this session, it is appropriate to reaffirm our collective devotion to the constitutive aspirations of our community and therefore the objectives of East African regional integration. There is no denying that our vision to be a prosperous, competitive, secure, stable, and politically united East Africa is taking shape at a higher rate than before. The ultimate aim of this noble enterprise is to transform and translate economic, political, and social, as well as cultural integration into a positive impact on the well-being of every citizen of East Africa. Our common agenda, therefore, is to set out optimal policies and strategies which unite us firmly in the singular pursuit of positive transformation in the political and economic, social and cultural, research and development, as well as technology and innovation, including defense and security, and also the legal and judicial sectors of our society. It is fair to say that much of our efforts cannot proceed let alone succeed without the loyal contribution and hard work of our community's legislative organs. This organ of IALA, as well as the respective parliaments. This assembly accentuates the direct linkage between common regional and specific intra-member state policies by performing the vital and simultaneous functions of embedding regional integration agenda at the heart of domestic policy making, while also ensuring that the ESC represents 
articulates and projects the interest of member states as well as the entire collectivity of our community. Our people's journey to a prosperous, competitive, secure, stable, and politically united East Africa entails the implementation of policies and establishment of institutions under the four well-known pillars of our integration, namely a customs union, a common market, monetary union, and a political federation. The instruments and frameworks needed to bring into operation our semi-autonomous institutions, delineate our areas of cooperation, and attend to the pillars of integration are promulgated under the exclusive mandate of this assembly, which has demonstrated exemplary dedication to its legislative function. Consensus deference to important lessons from the history of our regional integration efforts and a vigilant commitment to deliver a robust architecture for the successful delivery of an ambitious program of action for our community. By dint of a consistent drive to implement our collective vision for integration, this assembly has enabled us to overcome the shortcomings which rendered the first East Africa community so vulnerable that it ultimately collapsed, and to make significant progress on each pillar of integration, thereby making EAC a resilient, dynamic, progressive region on the threshold of historic transformation. Our customs union is on the move with this assembly creating legislative frameworks to establish a common external tariff, uniform customs rules and procedures, and common rules of origin. And I want to congratulate members here for being patriotic to ESC and making sure these instruments are in place. These frameworks also provide for the elimination of non-tariff barriers and the implementation of a single customs territory, one-stop border posts, as well as the facilitation of the development of regional and national trade information portals. For example, in a couple of weeks, President Museveni and I will be launching the uh, one-stop border post in Swam, a border between Kenya and Uganda, complete with a road connecting both countries that was sourced by, for, by funding that was collectively undertaken by the government of Kenya and the government of Uganda. Similarly, the assembly has provided the framework to conclude the Comesa ESC SADC tripartite free trade area agreement. The signing of the agreement establishes the African continental free trade area also and the adoption of the ESC e-commerce strategy. As you are aware, the bringing together of the tripartite agreement will bring 27 countries into one common market with a GDP of approximately $750 billion. That will make it possible for East Africa, parts of North Africa, and the whole of South Africa to trade together and to eliminate trade barriers that consistently stand in the way in our quest to enhance and expand business, trade, enterprise in our region. Consequently, the turnaround time for trucks has reduced significantly along all our transport corridors and the clearance in, in time at border crossings has reduced by 84%, making trade more efficient in our region. This is why intra-EAC trade holds the highest position among trading blocks in our continent at 25%. With a combined GDP of US dollars 350 billion, a population of approximately 350 million, 
and an expansive area of 5 million square kilometers, the ESC member states are an attractive investment destination. East African community total trade in 2022 stood at US dollar 74 billion. The same year, Africa accounted for 44% and 25% of ESC's total exports and imports respectively. This assembly, likewise, has enabled the community implement the common market protocol, which guarantees free cross-border movement of persons, labor, services, and capital, as well as the right of establishment and residence through the use of standard identification systems, harmonized travel documents, mutual recognition of qualifications, and harmonized labor and social policy frameworks. The ESC e-passport is now internationally recognized while several member states now permit citizens to travel using the national identity cards. Visa fees for cross-border movements have mostly been eliminated and cross-border communities now enjoy free movement. Students can enroll and transfer with greater ease the regional to, and regional institutions now implement mutual recognition agreements for various professional qualifications. To actualize the East African Monetary Union by 2031, because that's our aspiration, this assembly must provide the necessary framework to anchor the full implementation of the customs union and common market protocols, especially through the establishment of vital organizations such as the Monetary Institute, Bureau of Statistics, Financial Services, as well as the Surveillance and Enforcement Commissions. I know uh, this is already in your radar, and it is our hope as members of the summit that you will discharge your responsibility of making sure these instruments are in place to facilitate the greater integration of our union. Additionally, the Assembly should facilitate the convergence of criteria for macroeconomic governance and provide for the harmonization of both fiscal and monetary policies. The fourth pillar of East African integration, the political federation, depends on effective cooperation in the fields of political affairs, regional peace and security, as well as defense cooperation. The transitional model for our federation is already in place in the form of the East African Political Confederation, under which we have been able to deploy the East African Community Regional Force, for example, to restore peace and security in Eastern DRC, while other achievements under the transitional model include the Chief Justice's Forum to strengthen the rule of law, enhance access to justice, and facilitate the evolution of a distinct East African jurisprudence. Similarly, the other platforms have been established to enable progressive engagement between national institutions through the exchange of information, skills, and capacity, and developing common regional standards in such diverse fields as good governance, election management, and human rights institutions, and institutions that govern anti-corruption. We now have in place protocols on defense, as well as peace and security, together with the ESC Mutual Defense Pact, the ESC Early Warning Mechanism, Protocol on Combating Illegal Drug Trafficking, and ESC Interreligious Council, and a framework for conducting public participation on the establishment of the political federation, which has already been concluded in Kenya, in Uganda, and in Burundi, and we already made a decision last year in Arusha that that process must be concluded in the other uh, remaining states by June this year so that we can have a way forward. And I want to tell you, 
when this exercise was conducted in Kenya, it received overwhelming endorsement by the people of Kenya. It received similar endorsement in Burundi and in Uganda. I want to urge members of parliament who are here from our sister states of Tanzania, Rwanda, DRC, and South Sudan to assist the EAC Secretariat and the team that is mandated to carry out this exercise that this exercise be concluded as we have asked from the summit of the heads of state by June, so that we can begin to make steps in the right direction. And if there is an institution that will assist us in actualizing the aspirations of East Africans, it is this parliament. There is no doubt that as a result of the progress made in entrenching our regional integration as a social, cultural, political, and economic reality, East Africa is emerging as the beacon of unity, stability, security, and progress, and the beating heart of Pan-African integration and the engine of the Africa continental free trade area, as well as the epicenter of Africa's move to position itself as the next frontier of global investment and industrial transformation. That is why, honorable members, we have grown tremendously from three founding partner states to eight countries, connecting the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic, serving 350 million citizens and forging a major market. These achievements are chiefly due to the contribution to a great extent by the East African Legislative Assembly. The work that this assembly does matters to us as governments and matters to the people of East Africa. We must therefore remain focused on what is at stake, committed to complete the outstanding work, and determined to do our very best at all times when called upon to serve the people of our region. Peace, stability, and security must remain our foremost concern because they are the foundations that underlie all pursuit of growth, development, and prosperity. A peaceful, stable and secure East Africa is a competitive and prosperous East Africa. As we work and as we continue to work on such challenges to the growth of trade and investment as persistent on non-tariff barriers, distracting and costly trade disputes, conflicting tax regimes, weak enforcement and inadequate resources, we must also take seriously the fundamental shortcomings to our agenda that is low involvement of the private sector, even as we prepare to get and stay on top of emerging threats in the digital space, as well as climate change. Now that we have adequately established that this assembly possesses what it takes to drive our vision of a prosperous, competitive, secure, stable, and politically united East Africa. I take this opportunity, honorable members, to pose a few issues to the honorable members gathered here. It is important for us to lay a strong foundation for East Africa to make a transformative contribution to Pan-African integration and the emergence of the Africa continental area as the next hub of global investment, trade, and industry. In order to do this, we have to complete the implementation of all the pillars of ESC integration urgently and equally critically align our integration agenda with a broader African transformational paradigm under the Africa we want. 
Secondly, we must provide a strong framework for achieving rapid leapfrogging and the development of sustainable competitive advantage in emerging high-tech fields, such as the digital economy in general and artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, and machine learning in order to stay ahead of both threats and opportunities that will continue to unfold in a rapidly digitizing global economy. Thirdly, there is need to lend your support to the African Leaders Nairobi Declaration and Call to Action, which defines a strong and distinctly African contribution to the global discourse on humanity's foremost existential challenge by affirming the nexus between climate action and sustainable development and calling for increased investment in Africa to kickstart a green industrial revolution. Let me explain, because it is important. When we met in Nairobi last year, we made a deliberate decision that we were no longer going to be in the corner where we are seen as victims of climate change and where our big preoccupation is on complaining, finger pointing, and doing what we've done for many years, that we are going to reposition our continent as a place of opportunity, great potential, and ready for investment. Because indeed, it is no longer tenable for us to continue wearing the badge of conflict and disease and poverty when in our borders we have the largest deposits of mineral. In fact, 30% of world natural minerals and natural resources are in our continent. We have 60% of all renewable energy resources globally. We have 1.4 billion people market. In fact, by 2025, it is going to be the single largest market in the world. We have two thirds of the world's uncultivated, arable land that we can use for food security. Ladies and gentlemen, with those kind of resources, it is incorrect to classify our continent as a continent of conflict, poverty, and disease. In fact, as one Nigerian great philosopher said, that until the lion learned how to write their story, all stories glorified the hunter. <laughs> so it is time for us to write our own story. And our own story is not about disease, it's not about conflict, it's not about poverty. It is about great potential that we have, it is about the opportunities that we have, it is about the investment that is awaiting and position our continent as the only place where the next industrial revolution is going to happen. And therefore, it is important for you as legislators from ESC to appropriate this position so that together we can push a new narrative for our continent. To ameliorate the resource constraints which persistently hamper our progress, this assembly is called upon to reflect deeply on the range of opportunities and the various ways in which it can complement national and regional efforts to mobilize and allocate more resources for the regional integration agenda. 
And as you do that, you must have in sharp focus what we are doing in ESC and how we can complement what we are doing as a continent. In particular, I challenge you to apply your deliberative bandwidth to the forthcoming World Bank Group's International Development Association, Ida Summit. And let me explain what we are going to do in this summit. When we had this conversation last year, and our development partners realized that we were changing the narrative about our continent, and that we no longer wanted to be victims, we wanted to be part of the solution. They asked me to host the first IDA replenishment, what we are calling IDA 21 replenishment here in Nairobi, together with the World Bank. So we are going to host it on the 29th of April, 2024. And what is the conversation? The conversation here is East Africa will for the first time have the opportunity to witness from a close quarter and contribute to the important deliberations of critical implementation of our growth agenda and development. At this event, African leaders, including many from the global south and low income countries, will articulate a strong case for an ambitious and robust 21st replenishment of IDA, which is the largest source of development assistance and donor funding for basic social services for the world's 75 low-income countries, and to support economic transformation, especially in Africa and throughout the Global South. So uh, let me contextualize this. You know, we have two fundamental problems. And that is why many of our countries are struggling with the debt. Two fundamental problems. Problem number one is debt management. The kind of debt infrastructure that we have has very short grace period, has very short tenure, and therefore it becomes very difficult to, be, to undertake any meaningful development. Our position is that we should increase the grace period for money borrowed for development, not three years, maybe 10 years. We should increase the tenure of debt for development resources, not 15 years, but maybe between 40 and 50 years. That way, when you mobilize resources for development, you have adequate time to be able to undertake that development without the constraints of having to repay this debt. That is number one. Number two, the other problem that we have in the whole of financing development is what we are calling responsible sovereign lending. What do we mean by that? We're saying it is no longer tenable for us to have this big animal called uh, credit rating, where countries using arbitrary formula are rated here, and if you don't do certain things, you are taken down, and as you are taken down, you pay more interest. It is also, it, we need to have a conversation about credit rating agencies, and we need to have a conversation about risk assessment. Because there is perceived risk that becomes larger than real risk. And that perceived risk is pushed by certain quarters to make Africa uncompetitive. And that is the reason why, while others are accessing development resources at one or two percent, 
most African countries are accessing development resources in markets at between 10 and 15 percent. Explain to me, honorable members, if one group set of countries are accessing development resources at 1, 2 percent, and another is assessing between 10 and 15 percent, is it realistically possible for us to grow at the same rate? This is the conversation we must have, you know? And we must remove this arbitrary unfairness, you know, this arbitrary unfairness from global financing. And that is why we are saying we must have a thorough conversation about the reform of multilateral development banks and the whole international financial architecture as a whole. When we started this debate a year ago, we looked like mad people. But I promise you, today, in every meeting, everybody has come to the conclusion that there is a problem with the architecture of international financing. And the conversation is no longer if, the conversation is when are we and how are we going to reform it? And that is why it is important for institutions like the East Africa Legislative Assembly to apply itself, apply your mind to what kind of contribution are you going to make in this reform that is going to make our economies access development financing. It is the only way we can make meaning to our development. The last IDA replenishment, for example, in 2021, raised US dollars 91 billion, which was dispersed to eligible beneficiary countries over a period of three years. The Kenya summit that we are holding in April aims to highlight to donors and other development partners critical priority target areas of development financing in Africa and in our region, make the case for a significantly higher level of financing in either 21 cycle and support East African countries to effectively address development challenges and exploit the huge opportunities that we have in our region. This is the candid conversation we're going to have. And I am very confident that the fact that World Bank accepted that this was a necessary uh, exercise confirms to us that somebody somewhere is listening to what we are saying, you know? And our position is it is not going to be done until it is done. I have invited my fellow heads of state and government to participate in this highly important platform. Being confident of this assembly's capacity to facilitate transformative interven interventions, I urge you, honorable members, to join this course and formulate your, and your contributions to this endeavor with urgency. Give some imagination, put in it some ambition so that together we can push an agenda that is going to support all our economies. I am highly obliged to you, honorable speaker, for inviting me to address this assembly. I do not take your consideration for granted, and I believe we're going to have a discourse that is going to be beneficial for all our countries. I wish you all, honorable members, productive engagements, insightful debates, and fruitful deliberations as you usher in the third session of this assembly. Feel at home while you are in Kenya. It's called Magical Kenya, the home of all humankind. And I urge Honorable Omar Hassan, Chair of the Kenyan Chapter of the Assembly, to use his, this session to introduce you to the warmth and hospitality of our country. Uh, and I urge you, Honorable Hassan, to make that only in places that are licensed. and in no other places. So, honorable members, I really uh, wish you well while you are in Kenya. 
And maybe by conclusion, the speaker did make reference to um, what we are doing as East Africa. To, to give you the impression of what East Africa is doing, and, and therefore you must be very proud people that East Africa, in our continent, is the most progressive community. Our, our trade, intra-trade, between East African countries is the highest in the African continent. We are providing the leadership. And therefore, you occupy a very special place. And I want to urge you to continuously apply yourself to this huge responsibility. You are not only doing this for East African citizens. You are trailblazing for the continent of Africa. So continue with diligence, but also a pace to make sure that you help us move the continent together. It is the reason, for example, why as members of, of the summit in East Africa, as you're all aware, the chair of the AU is coming up next year as the term of Musa Faki, our current chair, comes to an end. It is going to be the turn for East Africa to provide the chair of the Africa Union. We have sat down in the spirit of the East African community. We have consulted as heads of state from the East African community together and we have agreed to sponsor one candidate as East Africans. As, as East Africans. Because that is the strength of our community, that we can do things together and we can consult amongst one another. So it speaks to the spirit of the leadership that is being provided by our region. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much. May God bless you. May God bless Kenya. May God bless East Africa. And thank you very much for listening to me. Asante Nisana.